goes. I'm thankful for that song. You know, the whole truth of that is he just wants you. Right? We're talking a little bit about that in Sunday school, how we think we've got to get all of these things right, then we can get to God. And God says, no, you just come, and I'll take care of the situation. You just come, I'll take care of the sin. You just come, and I'll give you what you need. What a God that loves us, no doubt about it. I want to talk about this morning the gift of time. And before you say we don't have any time, we all do have 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week and 52 weeks in a year, no doubt. Find Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. Again, with this mindset, the gift of time is what I'd like to talk about this morning. And again, there are 24 hours in a day, there are seven days in every week, and there are 52 weeks in every year that we are all gifted with. Ephesians chapter 5, if you found your place, please stand with me in the reading of God's word. We're going to read verses 13 all the way down through 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 13 all the way down to 21. Keep this mindset, the gift of time. Verse 13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, that would be aware, cautious, not as fools, but as Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Father, we come before you this morning Frail, but yet strengthened by your power. Weak, yes, but we can have the strength that we need from you. Holy Spirit, I ask for your work and your will to be done in the lives of all your people. You know the heart. You know every situation. You know every heartache. You know every care. You know things that aren't spoken, God. You also know our state. Lord, you know if any individual in here is not saved, you know what they're trusting or not trusting in. Lord, you know all of that. So I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that your work would be done that you'd convict, encourage, comfort, challenge. You know exactly what needs to be done in each and every individual, God. So I pray that you take this message, Lord, that it be proclaimed the way that you'd want it to, God. Hide me behind the cross. May nothing I say, Lord, be a deterrent to what the Holy Spirit's got to do. Lord, help me to stay close to the Word of God and to preach your message this morning, Lord. I love you. I thank you. It's by no accident that we're here, God. It's by no accident that you died on the cross of Calvary to provide for us eternal life. It's by no accident, God, that you can lead us and guide us. We have the Word of God. We have a church to come to. And to all that, I say thank you, Lord. I pray for your protection and watch care. Guard us, God, I ask it all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Appreciate you standing. You can be seated. So when you think about time, and I'm going to say it again, I know, but uh, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 52 weeks in a year. Now, time is something that cannot be produced, added to, or taken away taken away, it's all gifted by God. In other words, you cannot change time. Can't change it. Can't stop it either. Each individual in this room has a certain number of days, right? A certain number of heartbeats, a certain number of breaths, a certain number of words that are going to be uttered, and then it's all gone. You don't get a second shot. The average days for a person, because I'm basing this off of 70 years, I know the Bible says 70 to 80, but math for Marines was not my strong field, so. The average days a person lives is about 25,550 days. Now you subtract about 1,820 days because that's approximately five years, so from zero to five, I know some people can probably remember as early as three, but we'll just say from zero to five is pretty much your childish years, that puts you down to about 20,000 days. Now if you do the math on this, you caught up? You're missing all of them? 25,000 days, yep, subtract five years, you got about 23,000 days. 
which adds up to 613,000 hours. All right, we're all squared away. Now we have, he wants minutes. <laughs> you take 613 hours of an average individual, okay, subtract pretty much half that, more than half of that. Why? Because most people sleep for eight hours. And then most people have a 40 hour a week job. You're down to about 200. Thousand hours, which equates to 23 years. Now, don't the math that I just gave you is not inspired. I just want you to understand that. <laughs> but approximately, you're sitting at about 23 years of life out of your entire 70 years of life that you really have an opportunity to do something with that time. Does that make sense? Now, that can be argued because I know that you can do things at work as well for the cause of Christ. I get that. But just for the sake of uh, the argument of the context this morning, just kind of wrap your mind around 23 years of life of self-time that you may have. Now, for some of us in the room, 23 years, like the young folks might be thinking, well, that's a long time. For many of us, we look at 23 years like it's like that, right? Doesn't James chapter 4, verse 14 say, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, it is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And when you think about 70 years and you deduct that down to really 23 years of, if I could say, productive self time, because the rest of it's already scheduled for us through sleep and maybe eating and, and work and everything else that transpires in life. That leaves me 23 years of my 70 years of life to do something, we would say for self, but I want to argue this morning for the cause of Christ. Every minute of that, every second of that is a gift from God. You can't do anything to change it. You with me? I, the 23 years you can change, I get it. You can work less, you can sleep less. You can make some adjustments within that schedule. But that time is time that has been gifted by God and it's to be utilized however you seem fit, right? Really to be utilized for the way that God would have us to utilize it. Here in the book of Ephesians, we're told to redeem the time. And redeem would be, you know, if you think about taking in possession, uh, claiming it for self. We think of Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. He went to the cross, shed His blood to buy us, to pay our penalty, to pay our sin debt. So once we're saved, the Bible says we're not our own. We're bought with a price. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. So the moment I'm saved, I'm redeemed, yes, Jesus Christ redeemed me, but I belong to God, I belong to Christ Jesus, He's redeemed me. So when we think about this time, you have 23 hours, you need to redeem that time. In other words, make it useful, take possession of that time. I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about this, I think about the time wasted, right? Whether you're a Facebooker and you're looking at Facebook, right? Or, or you're a news watcher and we look at news. Or you're a, a warrior and not a warrior, but a warrior. You worry about things you ought not, right? I'm just saying the time that when you think about all that gets deducted quickly and we can't go back to recash it. There's no rollover hours, if you will. There's no rollover days. And the Bible tells us here that we are to redeem those Using the gift of time, if you will, for God. We find in the beginning of the chapter, we don't have time to go through all of it, but there is a great emphasis on moving away from darkness, moving away from sinfulness, moving away from that which is unrighteous. And he gets to the place where he even says, hey, I need you to be awakened or wake up, as he tells us in verse 14. Awake thou that sleepest. And you say, well, listen, I'm saved here this morning. Praise God. What are you doing with that 23 years? Listen, I'm, I'm a born-again believer, praise the Lord. What are you doing with the time? Are you redeeming this gift, God-given gift of time for your life to be redeemed for His honor and His glory and for His purpose? You know what I love about the redemption aspect of redeeming the time for God is that He will bless that now, but He will also provide for us the eternal treasures when we get to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. So it's an all-around win-win when we get to redeem our time for the Lord Jesus Christ now as well as for our eternity. But in the beginning, the only way we will recognize or realize or redeem the time for God is that we move away 
from that sinfulness. That we understand that sinfulness violates holiness and that sinfulness will violate our spiritual walk with God. And the more that I provide for myself that sinful makes this spiritual battle much more fierce within my life. But if I'll move away and know and focus and be aware and look to the Lord, it will help me to be attentive to this gift of time that He's provided for me. Wake up and redeem the time. Now many of us will spend our days in verse 16 worrying about the evil. So I love how the scripture is written out and he says in verse 16, redeeming the time, why? Because the days are evil. Listen, the evilness of the world is established, right? Sadly, or you could say it's a blessing because it's scriptural, Evil men will wax worse and worse in those days, right? Perilous times will come. We know that the evil of the world is going to get worse and worse and worse. He said, what are you saying, preacher? Don't be so concerned and focused on the evil that's going on around you that it steals your gift of time for the cause of Christ. You with me? It's already established. It's already a... Um, well, what do they call that? It's, an already, it's a known. It's, a, it's, it's not going to change. It's a, I can't think of math right now, but it's, it's never going to change. An absolute. We'll go with that one. The evil is established. It's not changing, right? But what is changing is what am I doing with the 23 years of my life that I can redeem? And listen, many of us don't have that 23 years left because we're getting closer. I'm halfway. I'm over halfway there, right? 35 would be halfway. So we've carved into that 23 years. So don't focus so much on the evil that's already established. So very quickly this morning, I just want to challenge us when we think about the gift of time, and it tells us to redeem the time in verse 16, how do I do that? Well, the very first thing we see comes in verse 15 and verse 17, and that is to be wise. Now, let me give you this precursor with being wise. In Proverbs, the Bible says that wisdom begins with the fear of evil. I'm sorry, the hating of evil and the fear of the Lord. What do you mean by the fear of the Lord? I reverence who God is. Can I bring that a little bit closer when we're talking about time? I recognize that God is the one that's gifted me this time. Then I need to utilize this time for God. Make sense? God says, here's the number of days. God says, here's the number of breaths. God says, here's the number of heartbeats. And thank God he's a merciful God, right? But there's a time when I think about salvation so often, especially in my life, there's a time when the breath stops, the heartbeat stops. And there is no more second chance for salvation. Just as much as if I burn up 2023 for me, I can't go back and fix it, but I can change in 2024 what I wish I'd have done in 2023, right? I messed up yesterday, but I don't have to mess up tomorrow. And I, all my testimony, I tell you, I grew up in a, in a church, I knew the gospel, yet I avoided it, completely walked away from knowing how to be saved until age 29. So I think maybe more to me, I'm skewed or more biased when I think about the fact of, wow, what mercy that God would have upon me. At age 16, I'd have punted me. I'd have been done with me. But God didn't. And He stayed merciful, convicting, using Scripture to get into my heart so that I would put a faith and trust in Jesus Christ at age 29, even though I denied Him for many, many years. He said, what are you saying all that for? Because I messed up. I didn't redeem my time during that process, but God was merciful to allow me more opportunities to redeem time. So you say, well, I've made a mess of my life. It's okay. I mean, don't take it that it's not okay you made a mess of your life, but it's okay in the eyes of God that you can get to Him and He'll take care of it. He'll wipe the slate clean. He says He chooses to forget our iniquities. He'll say, okay, dust us off, put us back on our feet, and say, you get back at it tomorrow. It's a merciful God, the God that gifted us this time. And if we don't fear and reverence Him, how can we redeem the time for him. So the very beginning of wisdom is understanding who God is and what God is and how that applies to my life and eschewing evil. But in verse 15 and 17, as Paul's penning this down, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly. And that just means cautious or watchful. That's all that he's saying. Not as fools, but as wise, right? Let me give you an illustration. If, if, if i got to go to Rochester, right, I'm going to make sure that I go during the right time and be in the right place. I'm not going to just be foolish and, and dabble around in places that I ought not be. 
You play with fire, you get burnt, right? You juggle knives, you're going to get cut. That's what I'm saying. So we don't want to be foolish. So what God is saying is saying, be cautious with your time. Be attentive with your time. Are there certain things in the Word of God that we know that are occurring and happening? Yes. But outside of all of that, guess what? As it is appointed unto man once to die, you will die. Therefore, be cautious with your time. Be cautious with your time. I cannot add to my time. Therefore, be cautious with your time. Make good decisions with your time. Don't be foolish. That's all he's saying in verse 15. Not as fools, but as wise. Verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, it's already established that evil is evil. It's already established, if you read the beginning of the chapter, that we are to get away from sin. It's already been established in the Word of God that we need to wake up and get busy understanding what the will of the Lord is. I want to pause for a minute because everybody, not everybody, there's a lot of people that I've talked to that say, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Okay? Sometimes it's God's will that they're a pastor, they're a preacher, they're a missionary. I get that. Okay? I'm not discarding that. All right? But what I want you to do is stay with me for a minute. Is it the will of God that you be saved? Absolutely. 1 John 3.23 and there you'll find this is my commandment that you believe on the name of the Son of God. He'll say, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So is it the will of God that every man be saved? Absolutely. What's the will of God for me? Well, if you're lost this morning, it's to be saved. That's the very first thing that you understand the will of God is for you, right? Is it God's will that you be baptized, water baptized? Is it God's will that you become a member of a local New Testament church? Is it God's will that you proclaim the gospel? Is it God's will that you study to show yourself approved unto God? Is it God's will that you pray without ceasing? Everybody with me? Is it God's will that you don't forsake the assembling together of ourselves? Everybody with me so far? We tracking? Is it God's will to memorize Scripture? Hide that word in my heart that I might not sin again. There's plenty of God's will that you do know that you can be redeeming your time in and not be so fretting about, oh, am I supposed to be a missionary? Am I supposed to be in Africa? Am I supposed to be in India? I'm not discarding that. But I'm just telling you, fulfill God's will that you know is God's will right now to see what would happen. Acts chapter 13, when Saul, I'm sorry, Paul and Barnabas were called, what were they doing? They were busy ministering unto the Lord. They were busy fulfilling God's will for that day and that time in their life at the church. What happened? God said, hey, I'm separating you two and sending you on this missionary journey. You with me? They were busy ministering. They were busy fulfilling God's will in their life already. They were already busy or being wise about their time, utilizing it for God's perfect will. So much of His will is already established. Don't get so hung up on the unperfect will. Plenty we know to do. Let's get busy with that. Being cautious, watchful, attentive to what is important. That's fulfilling God's will and way. Understand what God has for you and what you are to do for Him while you have your life right here. Wake up. Count your life and time for Christ while you can because He's gifted us time. Don't be foolish. When you think about the church of Ephesus, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself for the next one, but in Revelation chapter 2, what's the famous thing about the church of Ephesus? In Revelation, when they wrote the seven letters, what do we always pick on Ephesus for? Okay, everybody needs to read Revelation. <laughs> Turn to Revelation chapter 2 real quick. Revelation chapter 2. Ephesus, get picked, Ephesus, Ephesus gets picked on for these reasons. Look, man, Ephesians, I'm sorry. Good night of living. Help me, Lord. Revelation chapter 2, look at me at verse 4 and 5. This is the letter to the church of Ephesus. Okay. He says here in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because... Thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Ephesus, here, 40 to 50 years later, is accused of leaving their first love. Can I say this? As Paul is penning this letter to caution them, Paul doesn't know yet that the letter is going to be written because Paul dies off the scene 40 some odd years later when this letter is written. So Paul doesn't realize it. But Paul is telling them, redeem the time now. 
Now we see the importance of that. Why is that? Because if they don't redeem their time, what happens is you lose your first love. Can I say it this way? If we don't spend time with God, we'll get callous towards the things of God. How well would your marriage be if you never came home? Right? You with me? How well would your friendships be if you never reached out to your friends? How well would your paycheck be if you never went to work? Right? With me? How do they get to the place that they lost love with the God who saved them? They weren't redeeming their time. They were more vested in the sinful things of the world, the carnal things, or more concerned about the evils of the world than they were of the love of God. They were not wise with their time. They were not wise with their days. And it led them to losing their love for God. You have the gift of time. Be wise with your time. The second thing that we see is that he tells us to be filled. To be filled, verse 18. He says, And be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what that's telling me, there, there's times that we are filled with the Spirit, and there's times that we're not filled with the Spirit. And if I'm going to be wise with my time and wise with my days, then I want to live out my days with wisdom where I am filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? Now, so there's no confusion, and I know we beat this up quite a bit, but I want you to understand what the Word of God says. He says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, whom I've heard, trusted, believed, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Let me say it again. Heard, trusted, believed, sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. There's no water baptism. There's no Holy Spirit fruity thing that's going on. There's a, I've heard. I've trusted. I've believed. I'm now saved by my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Everybody with me? The moment I believe, the Holy Spirit of God indwells me forever. And you have all 100% of the Holy Spirit of God within you. You don't get 25% when you make a prayer, another 25% when you get baptized, another 25% when you speak in tongues, another 25%. No, no, no. That's not how the Bible works. All 100% of the Holy Spirit of God comes in you at the moment of salvation. With me? Amen. Now, this filling aspect is simply a yielding. Am I going to live how Dean Francini wants to live or how the Holy Spirit of God wants me to live? Everybody with me? So when I redeem my days, when I redeem my time... Let's chalk off eight. Let's chalk off another eight for work, right? Boom, that's gone, 16. That leaves me another eight hours. What am I doing with that eight hours? Am I yielding to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God? Listen, God's no fool. He understands you got to work. He understands you got to sleep. He understands you got to eat. He understands you got to take care of your family, okay? But God never says dismiss me for those things. God just says be wise with the eight hours that I give you, with the 24 hours that I give you, so that you can utilize that for my honor and my glory. That's all, God, that's, that's all God's saying. So Paul's writing to them and he says, listen guys, you need to be wise, fear the Lord. You need to be wise, understanding you only have so much time and so many days. And I've given you the instruction manual how to maintain those days. Now yield to that. Be filled, to the, be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's as simple as he's saying it. Did they adhere to that? 40 years later, we see that they didn't. They left their first love. They were too focused on what they wanted for their own time, and they were not yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, they left their first love. We can make the same mistake. Maybe we did make it in 2023. Maybe we did make it in December. It's okay. You can fix it. You can fix it. So there's times we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. There's times when we're not. Let me just say it this way. There's times that we're yielded to follow how the Holy Spirit of God would want us to walk. And there's times when we're not. When we're carnal, when we're in darkness, when we're in sin, we're yielded to self. When we're yielded to being a servant of God, we're yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. I just said moments ago, the more you love Him, the more you'll want to be with Him. Look at how we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God in verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So for me to be yielded, naturally, if I'm reading the Word of God, hymns, psalms, if I'm singing those things, if that melody is in my heart, what is that? It's driving me closer to my God. Driving me closer. Now listen, you could do those things at work. You can do those things driving down the street. 
You can do those things to put yourself to sleep. You can do those things when you wake up in the morning. You with me? You can do that so that when you wake up, you're wise and say, okay, God, now I want to give you my day. What wilt thou have me to do so that I can redeem my time for today to glorify you in all that I do? We take the time to prep our hearts for God. How? By these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Getting a heart that's ready, that's busting out and fully in love with Him, or as the Bible tells us, to love Him with all our heart, body, soul, and mind. Taking time to ensure that we are filled and yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Let's look at a comparison and a contrast really quick. Go back to Acts chapter 19 with me. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We just read Revelation 2, 4, so we won't go back there. But he said, you left your first love. Okay? Left your first love. Now look with me in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both the Jews and the Gentiles. Continued for two years, so that all they in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jesus and both the Jews. Now, where did Paul spend two years of his life? In Ephesus. So while Paul is in Ephesus, there's a few believers that are saved, and those few believers are what? Yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. They're redeeming their days for the cause of Christ, and the whole country of Asia heard the gospel as it was sounded out beginning there in Ephesus. Now when we compare that to Revelation chapter 19 verse 4, we find that I'm sure they're not doing anything for the cause of Christ because it says you left your first love. Let me, let me say it this way. Those two years that Paul was with them and encouraging them and teaching them and certainly for years after, they would get up in the morning and say, okay God, I got 16 hours today, what would you have me to do? Oh, tell my neighbor, tell Joey, tell Bobby, tell Susie, tell Sally. Good to go. I'll go and tell them. Oh, you want me to travel out to this city and tell them? You want me to travel out to this city and tell them? Hey, how about we disciple this individual so that they go and reach them? You understand what I'm saying? They woke up and said, God, what wilt thou have me to do? The whole nation was reached. Now we fast forward that 40 or 50 years. I'm sure there's plenty that can be involved. They got complacent. Maybe they just got distracted. Maybe they got carnal. Maybe the carnality swept in. Who knows? But what we do know is 50 years later, they didn't get up in the morning and say, God, I got eight hours today. What do you want me to do? What they probably did was wake up and say, boy, bless God, we got a good church. Things have been going good. And I'm going to go and do this, or I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to go and do this, and I'm going to go and do that. Oh, goodness, I better read the Bible before I go to bed. Oh, I better pray for Bobby, Joe, and Sally, and Sue, who I have not told the gospel to. Lost their first love. Had they still had a love for God, a whole nation of Asia still needed the gospel. With me? 45 years would cause them not to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. So we need to be wise, recognize we only have a certain amount of time. We need to be reverent, fearing God, and knowing that what He has for me is better than what I have for me. And I only have a certain amount of days to live out for Him. During that certain specific number of days, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, yielded completely to the Spirit's control. Verse 20. Third thing we find is that we need to be thankful. Giving thanks always... For the things that benefit me. Giving thanks always for when I get what I want. Giving thanks always when it's a good day. No. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now don't get mad at me because I do this from time to time as well. Hopefully I'm getting better at it, but... We sure do take a whole lot of time to make sure that we complain and we crab about things and we whine about things and we can sure be a negative type of people, can't we? We can sure take time for things that are completely ungodly. Government, politics, sports, I didn't get my way. You didn't get that way. I should have done this. I didn't do that. You with me? We can take time about that. 
Now, here's the true, sad, unfortunate part, right? Is even if we're not, quote unquote, that bad, think about all the time that we've spent complaining and whining and crying about things. Honestly, we cannot get it back. It's done. It's gone. We did not redeem the time, the gift of time that God gave us. As we increase this wisdom of how God tells us and we apply that knowledge and we yield to the Holy Spirit of God, I promise you, it's hard to be unthankful. It's hard to be unthankful. When you see God move in your life, when you see God move in the life of another, when you see God provide healing, when you see God provide an answer, when you see God provide pro- whatever God gives, it is so hard to be unthankful. I'm telling you, when your face is in the Word of God and your eyes are set upon heavenly things and your affections and your desires are placed upon God, it is too hard to be unthankful. I'm telling you, the smallest things of getting to a place safely is hard for us to be unthankful when we ask God to get us there safely. When we get to sit down at our table and eat food, it's hard for us when we don't pray. I mean, when, it's hard for us when we're praying and thanking God for providing that for us to be unthankful. All I'm trying to say is the more you look to Him, the harder it is to be unthankful. You know why we get to the complaining and whining and boo-hooing? We ain't looking at Him. And when we don't look to Him and we waste time and breath and words doing that, we're not redeeming the gift of time that God has provided to us. Now, I tell you, the people in Ephesus probably had a great, 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 great real reason to complain. (laughs) They were under persecution. They would have times and places where they couldn't preach openly. They would have times and places where they would lose their rights and their freedoms because they were standing for truth. They would have a real reason to, what we would say, complain or or bicker about something. They would have that. And Paul's telling them, listen, be thankful in all things. What Paul is telling them, hey, I know they're coming into your house. I know that they're not letting you worship freely. I know that they're stealing the word of God from you. I know that they're persecuting you for preaching the name of Jesus Christ. But I want you to be thankful in that. Wouldn't be possible if they were not wise or yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. I promise you that. We have way too much to be thankful for. Way too much. We've got to change our way of thinking to be more thankful than more unthankful, to be more grateful than to be ungrateful, to be more positive than to be more negative. I'll say this too, and I know it can go both ways. But if you just look back into 20 and 20, to 2023, I promise you, promise you, you can find some things to be thankful about. I know we can complain about everything under the sun. I get it. But I promise you, if you look back and look for the hand of God, you'll be grateful, thankful, and praising God. And that's all Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, look, I want you to look to the good and not the negative. So maybe we messed up last year and we weren't very wise. That's okay. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth, uh, who giveth liberally without upbraiding. You say, well, I wasn't really filled with the Spirit of God too much last year. It's okay. You start to sing melodies in your heart. You start to put your face in the Word of God. You start to get around the people of God and start yielding to the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God lead you in your decisions more than you did last year. Well, I was just a Krabby Patty last year. Well, don't be a Krabby Patty in 2024. Lastly, there's one other thing we see. And that's be submitted in verse 21. So we recognize by being wise that time is a gift of God. And I recognize if I'm going to use my time wisely, I need to be yielded to the Spirit of God. The more I'm yielded to the Spirit of God, the more time will be spent being thankful, which will lead me to be submitted. He says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now let me put you in context. He's saying submitting yourselves one to another. Who's he talking about? The church of Ephesus. There's a body of believers together, a local New Testament church. He's saying you submit to yourselves one to another. 
You be submitted, forbearing, assisting, or as the Word of God says, uh, in honor, preferring another above myself. You be submitted to one another. Can I say it this way? You be a family within that church. We live in a world that's so divided. (laughs) Divided over everything. Government, politics, sports, church. Bible, I mean, we're divided over everything, right? And Jesus gave us, if, 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 if a kingdom is divided, it what? It cannot stand. If you're divided at home, you're going to struggle. If you're divided in the church, it's going to struggle. <laughs> if you're divided in anything, it's going to struggle. That's why even he said in, in chapter 4 where he's talking about until they come to the unity of the faith. Listen, what he's saying is church Ephesus... Keep focused, stay organized. You guys need to stay united together, submitting one to another for the cause of Christ. Why? You only have so many days. Oh, but sister so-and-so said this about me. A brother so-and-so said this about me. And I'm, bo- I'm not going to talk to her for 16 days. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to church. That church is full of hypocrites. Nowhere else is just the church. They're full of hypocrites. And they just, you don't understand what brother so-and-so said and sister so-and-so. I just, no, I just can't do it. So I'm going to have a grudge for 60 days. I know we're laughing, but we do it. Sixty days I didn't redeem the time for the Lord. Sixty days is gone. I can never do anything about it. Can repent, get things right, and then submit. Submit. God didn't design the church for us to all come and fight with one another. I hope you understand that. God established the church for us to be a family to help one another. I'll be honest with you. I'm tired of this whole corporate idea that church is a business. I'm tired of it. God brought each and every one of us together for a purpose. Yes, to help all all of those wonderful things. Bear with me, but he brought us together to help and support one another. Yeah, you get fed the word of God if you come to every service four hours a week. I get it. But you and I need help outside of these walls, right? Right? We're to help one another, pray for one another, take a meal to somebody, send a text to somebody, give a phone call to somebody, put in some elbow grease for somebody, right? Be the one that has to go there and say, listen, I need you to get right with God. These things are in your life. They're not going right. We've got to be forgiving of one another so that we can forbear one another. You with me? Why? Because Paul says you've got to submit one to another because you must redeem the time. Time's too short for us to be Cry babies in high schoolish with each other. Couldn't think of a better way to say it. We don't have time to be divided. We need to be in one accord, unity of the faith, the Bible tells us. We're a family in the local church for the purpose of using our time for His glory. So we need to submit to each other. Humble, our say, humble ourselves, abase ourselves, honor and preferring others above our own self. All done biblically in the fear of God, in the reverence of God, His ways. Submitted to His cause. Paul's writing to the Ephesus church and he wants them to get away from spending their gift of time in sinfulness, selfishness, and change to spending their gift of time in holiness, to get out of that darkness and to get into light. Paul would say it this way, you only have a short amount of time, you ought to live it for God. You ought to be all in. You need to recognize this blessed, wonderful gift that you cannot change, but you can use wisely for God. Don't waste this gift of time. Don't blow it. Paul would get to the end of his life and what would he say? I've kept the faith. I've kept the fight. Right? That's what Paul would say in the end of his life. I've kept it. I've been beaten. I've been imprisoned. I've been... Some awful things have happened to me, but, but I've kept it all the way to the end. I've, I've tried to redeem my time For the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter the situation, no matter the scenario, I redeemed my time for the cause of Christ. I think the early church of Ephesus could say the same thing up to even to the place of this letter being written seven, eight years after that church was established. But I wonder how many of those people maybe from the inception of that church that could still be alive when that letter was given out by John had said, hey guys, y'all left your first love. 
They could probably sit down and, and mope and groan and compli- complain and, and make excuses on why they got to that place. Or they could just say, you're right, God. I've spent the last so many years not redeeming my time for the cause of Christ. And I want to repent of that, God. I want to make that change in my life and I want to turn to you. Maybe an application to us. Maybe I've said it already in 2023. We didn't do everything that we should have done. If you'll repent truthfully from the heart and confess that to God, He'll wipe the slate clean. It's gone. The only people that bring it back up is you and I. God doesn't. He says, you're forgiven. Go forth and do great things. He says, you're forgiven. I'm not going to be reminded. I'm not going to remember those things again. And when the devil reminds you of that, you just tell the devil, I've given it to God. I'm done with it. God's forgiven me. I didn't redeem my time, but I asked God forgiveness. God forgave me. Now I'm going to redeem my time. I'm going to be wise. And I'm going to be filled with the Spirit of God. And I'm going to be submitted to the cause of Christ. I'm going to give myself for His glory. And you know what? I'm going to be thankful about all of it. I'm not going to look back and be unthankful. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look back and say, well, God bless me there. God took care of me there. God met the need here. God saved this individual. God allowed this individual to be baptized. God kept me safe here. God healed this person here. God took care of this. You with me? Stop looking back at all the negative and let's look back and be fueled with all of the positive and all the good and the cause for Christ that we can do from this point forward. Redeeming our time. Two thousand hours, two hundred thousand hours adds up to about twenty-three years of life. How much of that twenty-three years of life will we be wise, be filled, be thankful, and be submitted? He might be sitting there thinking, "Well, when am I going to die?" I have no idea when you're going to die. Nobody knows when they're going to die. You can be the most fit, healthiest person in here. You can be the most unfit, unhealthiest person in here. When God says it's time, it's time. Now, there's some things you can do to prolong your life you can see in Scripture as you uh, are obedient. There are some things that can change that. But when God says it's time, it's time. It's it. And when we go before God in that judgment and we see God, how will we answer that question of, well, son, daughter, how did you redeem this gift of time that I gave you? You say, I'm close to the end of my life. It's okay. Confess, redeem the time. Say, I'm young, I don't know, and I have all these decisions. That's right, you can't go wrong by redeeming your time for the cause of Christ. Say, I'm in the middle of my life, and boy, I've blown a whole bunch of it. I'm with you. It's okay. I can ask God to forgive me and redeem the time from this point forward. But I don't know when I'm going to die, but I do know this. I already said the verse, as it is an appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. If you're lost here this morning, the Bible does say today is the day of salvation because you don't know that last heartbeat, that last breath. And you will go before a holy God. And there's only going to be one question asked. Did you believe in my son Jesus Christ or not? That's it. They're going to open the books. If your name's not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life because you believed in Jesus Christ, you're not getting into heaven. There is no going back. There is no repeat. There is no reset. If you're a video gamer, it's none of those things. You cannot change it. It's a done deal. You'll stand before God and He will say, did you believe in my Son, Jesus Christ? Done deal. Yes, you get into heaven. No, you're going to a devil's hell. Where do you stand? Are you saved? Are you born again? You say, yep, I've been saved. Praise God for that. There's a time in your life that you knew you repented of your sin and you trusted and believed in Jesus Christ. The Bible says you're going to give a judgment for the good and bad that you've done in your body. In other words, it's going to be this way. Did you believe in my son? God already knows. You're in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes, you get in. Then it's going to be, well, let's list out your lifetime after salvation and let's see what you've done good for me and what you've done bad for me. That's illustrated in 1 Corinthians as silver, gold, and precious stones, eternal treasures. This one's listed out as wood, hay, and stubble that gets all burned up. And the more time that I spend being foolish, not submitted, not yielded, not thankful, is all that wood, wood, hay, and stubble that gets burned up. But all the times that I've spent 
submitted, yielded, thankful, filled with the Spirit of God, focused on the cause of Christ, are those gold, silver, and precious stones that are eternal treasures. I have no idea how many hours eternity is. I have no, many, I have no idea how many days eternity is. I have no idea how many months eternity is. But I do know this. It's a whole lot more than 70 years, 600,000 hours, and 23 years of life that I can live for God. Far better, far better to redeem the time for Christ than to redeem it for self. All of us have been gifted time. You say, we don't know about that. Well, you're sitting here before me and you're breathing and you're paying attention. Well, you're awake. <laughs> the question is, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? Will you be willing to redeem your days, your time, for the cause of Christ? Paul, no doubt, was concerned about this church at Ephesus. He didn't know in 50 years that they were going to be more attracted to their own things than godly things. But here's the deal. He warned them, redeem your time for me, for the Lord Jesus Christ, before it's too late. Because those people that were in that church at 20 who were receiving that letter at age 70 could not go back and change that 50 years. They can change tomorrow, but they couldn't change the 50. Had they taken heed to the letter that Paul written, the Word of God, they could have made the change at age 30 so that they would not be the ones hearing at age 70, you've lost the first love. So many days, what will we do with them? So much time, what will we do with them? So much breath. What will we do with it? So many words. What will you do with them? Father, thank you, Lord, for the precious word of God. Lord, time truly is a gift. It doesn't stand still. We can't create more of it. We can't go back and fix the past of it either, Lord. All we can do is live in the moment, live in the time. And God, we've been warned, as the people at Ephesus were warned, and many of them didn't take heed to it because the whole entire church will be said that they lost their first love. God, let that not be said about us. Certainly as Anchor Baptist Church, Lord God, that it would never be said of us that we've lost our first love. But the church is made up of a body of believers that have been baptized, that have joined this body. Lord God, what will they, I, do with our time? Lord, I pray, help us to redeem it for your glory. I beg you, Father, Holy Spirit, please, if somebody's lost here this morning, help them to understand they do not know when that last breath, that last day will come. They can redeem the time, the gift of life, the gift of eternal life, Lord, if they will turn of their sin and trust you, if they will repent of their sin and by faith cry out to you, Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again the third day to take our sin away. Only you can redeem us to give us that everlasting life, God. I pray this morning, if anybody's lost, they'd realize... Death's knocking at the door. Could be tomorrow, could be 80 years from now, but it's going to come. Where will they spend an eternal life? God, help them to see they need you. Father, those of us that are saved, please, please, God, will we be wise in 2024, Lord? Lord, will we be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in 2024? Will we be more submitted in 2024, Lord God? Will we be more thankful in 2024? Help us to realize the error of our ways and say, today, God, I'm going to take this and redeem my time for your glory, for your honor, for your cause. Father, I thank you that we can have a time to make the preaching of the word of God personal. And Lord, I pray that that time would be taken here in a moment when we ask your blessings on the invitation, the music will start, Lord God. People will have an opportunity to step to say yes, to say no, to respond or not respond, Lord. And whether that's to salvation or just a life that needs to be changed for your glory, whatever it is, God, please, I pray nothing would hinder them from moving forward. Maybe they just need to take some time where they're at. Whatever it is, God, I just pray, Lord, let the devil not steal. Help us to redeem the time to say, Lord God, I need to do this in my life and I'm going to do it. I'm going to respond. I'm going to react to the preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, I beg you for your help. Please, bless the invitation, give boldness, give courage, and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you're lost this morning... And